Quentin Marcellus. I started playing the trumpet when I was six years old. And even though I wasn't aware of it at the time, the roots of my jazz playing began more than a century ago. With all the heroic individuals whose need to express their humanity gave birth to this uniquely American democratic art form we call jazz. A music sustained by successive generations of musicians who figured out how to play it, brought it as far as they could, and left what they could as a mark for others to shoot for, to learn from, and also to surpass. That's my background and my inspiration. The history and tradition of this great music, and it's essential to anyone who wants to play jazz or listen to it with a genuine level of appreciation. Those of us playing today have access to this history through books, records, music schools, and even shows like this. But what about those early players? the ones who played jazz before it even had the name. They had an entirely different method of learning. First of all, simply by doing it, sharing their music with each other and being fortunate enough to live in communities which encouraged, even celebrated their creations. New Orleans, where I'm from, was the home of much of this early music. And what was played at parades, funerals, picnics, weddings, parties, bars, sporting houses, and all night dances soon developed that extra swing, picked up from blues, ragtime, and just the rhythms and rigors of life. The cornet, the darker sounding brother of the trumpet, was the lead instrument in these bands, and the first jazz musician to make the instrument famous, in fact, the first major jazz figure, was this man, Buddy Bolden. Buddy's career began in 1895. He was a star, attracting people through his personality and his playing. Among the great players after Buddy were Mutt Carey, Freddie Keppard, Bunk Johnson, Manuel Perez, and Joe Oliver, known as the King, King Oliver. was Oliver in 1923 playing with a mute. You can see it in the end of his cornet. He also was well known for this device. Short breaks in the music where all the other instruments drop out, leaving only the two cornets improvising in harmony to confront the open space and time. Those two horns were played by Oliver and his protege a young New Orleans musician who would later introduce himself thusly. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Mr. Armstrong, and we're going to sing one of the good old good ones for you. Beautiful number. Dinah? Dinah. They got them on. Are you ready? They got them.
there he was, Louis Armstrong, Pops, at that time just 32 years old, spreading the word of jazz throughout the world, playing, singing, being. Louis Armstrong personified American jazz. He was to jazz what Shakespeare was to writing or Picasso to painting. He redefined everything that had taken place before him and influenced everything that came after. On the trumpet, he did things that no one had ever heard, let alone thought of before, like this octave glissando done with half valves. Trumpet players trying to figure out how to do that from listening to Lewis on the radio or phonograph would have to give up and wait until Lewis came to town so that they could be frustrated by seeing him do it live. I've heard that he could hit 100 high C's in a row, so great was his endurance. And the first time he went abroad, European trumpeters insisted on inspecting his horn for hidden devices. They just couldn't believe that someone could play like that without some sort of artificial assistance. But Lewis's contribution to jazz was much, much more than his overwhelming technique. It was his feel, his phrasing, his sense of time. Singing or playing, he could breathe life into the simplest popular song and turn it into a timeless masterpiece. I but one sun. I'm watching the sea. Because one I love soon come back to me. I covered the world run in search of my love and I'm covered by the solid kind of love. Oh, baby, every mind was shortly waiting, hoping it's on the run. Where were you? Are you forgetting? Did you remember? Did you return? I covered the world He was jazz's first great soloist, showing all other instrumentalists, not just trumpet players, how to do it. He was Louis Armstrong, father of us all. King Oliver, Bonk Johnson, Buddy Bowling, George Bruner, Swingy Manon, Tony Perrini, Zuddy Singleton, Louis Russell, Paul Barber, and all so many of the boys, Sidney Bachet. Louis Armstrong, they all were there. I was there with them. I couldn't miss. My father had the band. Henry Allen Senior, New Orleans.
right down to St. James and Pamrad. Found my baby there. She was stretched out on a long white table. So cool, so cold, so fair. Let her go! this was shot 40 years later, that bold, exuberant style was the way the trumpet was usually played in the 20s. But not by everybody, not by Bix Beiderbecke. Spiderbeck developed a clear, light, open tone of his own and listened to Ravel, Debussy, and other European classical composers for some of his harmonic ideas. In his own time, he didn't have wide public recognition, but he was a strong influence on some other musicians, and many went out of their way to hear and learn from him. When Biggs died, much too young at 28, his legend began to transcend his music, and he soon became sort of a romantic figure in jazz. Like Bunny Berrigan, who also died young, only 34. Until today, I never knew until today how really beautiful this blue world could be. Till you smile at me. Buddy played jazz with Tommy Dorsey and other bands, and also often appeared with commercial bands like this one. But he always had a big warm tone and a fine way of playing ballads. This is a band led by Red Nichols, a player a little in the style of Bix Beiderbecke, but with more commercial success. Some players were important in that they exerted tremendous influence on the history of music. Others had more of a social significance in that they were able to take some elements of jazz and popularize the concept of jazz to a wider audience. Everybody wants my baby, that's the case, where do you come in? 
Haunted by Hello, Red. By Hello, son. Say, Red, have you got you a gal? I certainly Well, tell us, Red, what do you do when you stare at nature, pal? Treat, treat, treat. that authentic big band song of 1930 not just any big band mind you but duke ellington's with freddie jenkins playing the trumpet left-handed something you definitely don't see too often and freddie and the whole trumpet section fanning the bells of their horns with 10 derbies making this song there are many ways to create effects on the trumpet derbies mutes growling into the horn, false fingerings, even bathroom plunges. Composers and arrangers use these effects, but Duke and the members of his band were the first to take these sounds and make them into a comprehensive language, integrating them meaningfully into the music. When Duke wrote a piece of music, he did so with the particular sound and abilities of each member of his orchestra in mind. Like this piece for Cootie Williams, showing what Cootie could do using a simple bathroom plunger as a mute. Plunger mutes go way back in jazz, at least to 1925, when Bubba Miley used them so creatively in many of his solos with Duke.
This was a period when trumpet players like Lewis and King Oliver were backing great blues singers like Bessie Smith, often using mutes to echo the sound of the human voice on their horns. Some trumpet players plunge a mute could imitate vocal sounds so closely it was almost as if they were singing through their trumpets. Another role for the trumpet, especially in big bands, is playing the really high notes. This is sometimes called the screech trumpet part. The normal range of the trumpet in European classical music was around high C or D, regular B flat trumpet. Those two notes. In the 20s, Louis Armstrong came along, not only hitting high E flats with ease, but also doing it with such nobility that he changed the very concept of the trumpet sound in that register. He showed that it could be played this high without sacrificing musical integrity or being used as a trick. Soon, other players were reaching for even higher notes. A few began to specialize, sometimes using custom-designed mouthpieces, and the playable range of the trumpet kept going up as high as altissimal C, the C above C above high C, and more. Soon, high note playing became a specialty in itself, and trumpeters got recognition and a lot of work of this ability. One of the best ever was the incomparable Cat Anderson, Duke Ellington's favorite. Watch here. We're about to see Cat with Ellington playing one of Duke's classics, Rockin' in Rhythm. First this plunger trombone solo by Lawrence Brown. then joined by Cootie Williams on the left and Herbie Jones for more plunger work. And now, check this, Cat Anderson.
The best jazz combines improvisational creativity with instrumental ability. But by the 30s, some trumpet players could become stars just on the basis of their dazzling technique, like Harry James. This is not really jazz, but it's some pretty fancy trumpet playing. Someone once called jazz art for the moment, and that pretty well sums it up. Art that is conceived, structured, developed, and performed simultaneously in an unbroken stream of time. Any jazz technique or special skill that a musician develops must be in service of that art. Here are two film clips that show how technique and creativity can combine to create beautiful jazz. First, the great Rex Stewart. Another long time Ellington sideman using half valves, trills, rips, high notes, and quotes from other songs, and a lesson on how to play the blues. Now, Charlie Shavers and Buck Clayton in a classic cutting contest, musical one-upmanship, challenging and inspiring each other through a series of brilliant choruses, transforming a popular melody into timeless jazz.
While the music of the 20s and 30s continued to be popular well into the 60s, the 1940s marked a turning point in the history of jazz, the emergence of a new musical style. On the trumpet, the bridge between old and new was Roy Eldridge, who played with the fire of a young Louis Armstrong and the dexterity of saxophonist Coleman Hawkins. Here's Roy in a group that includes Coleman Hawkins on saxophone, Cozy Cole on drums. <laughs> First Lewis, then Roy. And after Roy, Dizzy. was a very young Dizzy Gillespie, looking like me, in front of an orchestra he put together to translate the new music of bebop into the big band sound. Without discussing technical terms like extended harmonies, chromatic scales, and polyrhythms, and so forth, this was simply a new music. And like any new music, it was very difficult for some to accept. One of Dizzy's first jobs was with Cab Calloway. And when Dizzy took some solos, Cab would tell him to stop playing that Chinese music. And even Lewis himself initially put Dizzy and Bebop down, singing a parody of the Whiffin' Poof song, calling them poor little lambs who have gone astray. But actually, Dizzy did for the trumpet in the 40s what Lewis did for it in the 20s. He changed the way players looked at the trumpet and the concept of what could be done with it. Even to this day, he is the only player to discover another way of playing rhythms different from Lewis Armstrong. He also played so high and so fast and made strange intervals sound so easy, it was as if he was playing a new instrument. Twelve years later, Dizzy had matured and was playing a horn he designed to hear himself better. But the music was just as exciting. And there was still no limit to what he could do with the trumpet. Thank you. 
music of bebop was more complex rhythmically and harmonically than anything that had come before it and required instrumental and intellectual skills to match. Some players and listeners associated this increase in skill and intellect with a decrease in emotion, but actually, it created room for even greater and more subtle forms of emotional expression. This is Fats Navarro, Fat Girl, who could play pretty at any tempo with his warm tone and all those grace notes. Fats played with Bird and Dizzy in the 40s, but there's nothing of Fats on film and little on record because he died very young, at the age of 27. But his style was echoed in the playing of Clifford Brown, who began recording in 1950, the same year Fats died. Five years later, Clifford was dead in a car accident, only 25 years old. A tragically abrupt end to a person whose playing and personality was so full of promise in life. The spirit of both men, Fats and Clifford, seemed to live on in the music of this man, Lee Morgan, playing here with Art Blakey and the jazz messages. This solo, full of fire and feeling, is classic jazz of the hard bop period of the 60s. Once again, a brilliant career was tragically cut short. Lee lasted a little longer than Clifford or Fats, but he was dead at 34. Jazz, like all art, has many forms. While players like Dizzy Gillespie, Fats Navarro, Clifford Brown, and Lee Morgan were pushing the limits of bebop, Miles Davis, who began playing with Dizzy and Charlie Parker, was going his own way.
That was the one and only Miles Davis with the Gil Evans Orchestra and the small group, including Paul Chambers on bass, John Coltrane on saxophone, Wynton Kelly on piano, my namesake, and also Jimmy Cobb on the drums. This is beautiful, elegant playing, not the complicated music of bebop with chord changes every bar, but instead the simple structure of a few modal scales where the challenge is the creation of beautiful melodies that extend over longer periods of time with far fewer notes to choose from. Miles was a master at this type of playing, and his solos from that era were like poetry. Yet this was only one stage of his long career. From his beginnings in bebop, unlike many other players, Miles has never stayed in one place. He has continued to search for new forms of musical expression, sometimes with more musical success than others, but continually inspiring successive generations of musicians. Miles' playing in the 40s and 50s affected not just other trumpet players, but a whole style of jazz, which was called cool jazz. This restrained, understated way of playing became especially popular amongst West Coast musicians. This is Shorty Rogers, a classic example of the West Coast sound.
case you didn't notice, Shorty was not playing a trumpet. It was this instrument. A flugelhorn, pitched just like a trumpet, but with a softer, mellower sound derived from its wider, more conical shape. Trumpet, flugelhorn, cornet. It's tough enough to play any of them, but can you imagine playing two at the same time? This is my musical daddy, Clark Terry. Listen as Clark uses the contrasting textures of the flugelhorn and the muted trumpet to construct this short, beautiful solo. Here's Nat Adderley playing a cornet, something that's not seen too often in contemporary jazz, and doing something else unusual also, playing notes that are usually only a part of our daily warm-up, pedal notes, the notes below the given range of the trumpet or cornet. Shortly after trumpeter Lee Morgan left the Jazz Messengers, his part was filled by another young player, Freddie Hubbard. Ever since, Freddie has been one of the most powerful and gifted players on the jazz scene. Here, playing flugelhorn, he interprets the old classic, I Can't Get Started.
Like all of life, jazz is tradition and continuity. No matter how different our individual styles, jazz evolved from a group sensibility, and we all draw from the same heritage. So what better way to end the show than with this clip of two of the giants of the jazz trumpet and their one and only appearance together? Don't mind. 